Twitter handle somewhere on the slide. You can find it. You can heckle with me via Twitter. Um, and it's remarkable just how full this room is. It's a Python conference, and we're talking about types. And we know that types and Python don't mix. So I can only assume the reason why you're all here is because you hate Python. Um, why do you hate Python? <laughs> Haskell person. Stop that. <laughs> um, so um, I'm here to talk to you about the type hinting stuff that is about to happen uh, in Python. And to do that, we need to start with a bit of history. Um, it's been a long time coming for Python to start getting uh, some degree of uh, static typing. Our Python started off using this thing called duck typing, um, where you can pass in arbitrary objects in the hope that they have the methods and properties that, that you care about and the, that are used by the function that you're going to pass it to. Um, and this is, this is generally a, a pretty good thing. And we, we went with this for about you know, the first 17 odd years of the existence of Python. And this made pretty much everyone happy about it. You know, our code generally tends to work. Hasn't been a problem that we haven't had types. Um, but uh, when Python 3 came around, they introduced this thing called function annotations. And this is basically, you specify um, annotations to arguments on, by putting a colon up the argument and then putting something after it, and then return annotations by putting an arrow at the end of your argument list and putting something on the right of that arrow. Um, these were introduced as part of the Python 3 spec and landed in Python version 3.0. Um, now these function annotations were interesting in that they didn't actually specify what they were going to be used for. Um, they did not need to actually be type annotations of any sort. They could be anything. So for example, if you wanted to automatically generate some documentation, uh, you could make some, a tool chain that would take the annotations that were strings and use that to produce um, documentation for each of your, your arguments and your return. You could put anything you liked inside, uh, those, inside those annotations. And basically what this meant was that because they didn't really specify what um, the point of these annotations were, um, nobody really did anything with them for the first few years of Python 3's existence. Um, type checking was in that PEP for type annotations, uh, but there was not really any good way of doing um, type checking. So the feature just sat unused for about five years. So PEP 484, which was released this year, finally proposes using these annotations uh, to do type checking. Uh, these annotations, uh, they show a function that takes a string as an argument and returns a string. So PEP 484's approach is to use these annotations and provides a bunch of hint objects defined in a module called typing in the standard lib, and it provides a type checker to provide uh, basically type linting functionality. And all of this type hinting functionality that's introduced in PEP 484 has been implemented without making any changes to the language itself. Now, for those of you who aren't terribly familiar with how uh, Python um, adopts new features, it has this process. It's a three-stage process officially. Uh, first, a PEP gets proposed on a mailing list and discussed. Stage two is that the PEP gets adopted, and stage three is that the feature gets uh, added to the next Python release. Now, what actually happens is the most important step. Basically, everybody needs to forget the thing was ever proposed for the first few years of its existence. And basically, this means that by the time people are using a thing in Python, um, it's mature, and somebody in core Python has figured out how to properly use it. And because there are people out there who know how it's meant to be used properly, nobody really questions the feature as it's, um, as it's adopted. There's a slight problem with this process this year in that at PyCon 2015 in Montreal, uh, Guido came up and gave a keynote about how type hints um, were going to be adopted in Python, uh, which meant that this really, really important phase of the Python uh, feature adoption process did not happen. Everybody at that keynote saw this feature before there was an implementation and came up with terrible ideas about what it means. So even though the PEP itself says, you know, it should be emphasized, the authors are not going to ever make type hints mandatory, you get grumpy people like Jack Diedrich who say that this PEP hides Python 4. It's going to completely fundamentally change how Python is ever going to work. And 
the discussions around PEP 484 have basically been this tar pit um, because people don't know what type hints are about. Uh, they assume it's going to be something terrible like Java uh, because that's the only other language they've seen which is statically typed. And Java's static typing is frankly terrible. Um, and I guess the only way to solve this problem for you to get an understanding of how this works is to go out and use the type hinting stuff that PEP 484 uh, proposes. Um, unfortunately, there is a slight problem with this, and that's that there is no stable release of Python with this type hinting stuff in there. And even if there was, nobody is using it yet, um, which means you can't actually go out and use this stuff. Um, so what I'm going to do instead is take a look at it in a language that hopefully you already know. And that language uh, I'm going to look at is JavaScript. Um, perhaps unfortunately, I reckon the majority of people in this room have done some level of development with JavaScript, even though this is a Python conference. You kind of have to use it if you're doing web front-end stuff. Um, now, TypeScript is a Microsoft technology. Uh, you might notice somewhat uncharacteristically I'm wearing a college shirt. This is a contractual obligation. <laughs> Um, it is an open source project and it's been out since 2012. It's relatively stable. Um, it's basically just a type hinted version of JavaScript. To give you an idea of, what, of how similar it is, uh, here is your standard hello world in JavaScript. You'll notice the console.log and a string in there. And this is hello world in TypeScript. Are there any questions? <laughs> TypeScript is just JavaScript in its simplest form. If you want to start writing more complicated, uh, if you want to start seeing the differences, you have to write more complicated code. Uh, so here is a, uh, a slightly more um, interesting function that's referring to another conference. I'm sorry about that. Um, it takes a string parameter and it returns a string. This is the version of that in TypeScript. Uh, as you can see, there's a type hint. Um, on the input parameters, and there is a type hint for the output. Both of those say that it is a string. Uh, if we call this function with something that is not a string, it will break. And if we try to assign uh, the output of, of that function to something that isn't a string or isn't expecting a string, uh, that will also fail. Now, TypeScript, it basically runs through a compiler which does a type erasure pass on your code and it will emit something that looks remarkably similar to actual JavaScript and the actual JavaScript you probably would have written anyway. Um, under the hood, it's exactly the same. Uh, the compiler just verifies that your types are consistent and then gets rid of all the type annotations. It runs in exactly the same way as your JavaScript would have. Um, now, because in this one uh, our variable a is a string and two uppercase returns a string, uh, we can make another variable b without saying what its type is, and the type checker will know that it is a string and we can validly pass it into that hello function. Um, this is type inference. It means that you don't need to manually hint every single function and every single variable you have. Sometimes the compiler can figure out what is going on for you. Um, so this code, even though it looks basically the same as the code on the last slide, uh, we have a function that returns a number, therefore we can't pass the variable d into that function that expects a string. The compiler knows that d is a number, therefore the types are inconsistent. And so what this means is that you, if you write code that only interfaces with type checked functions and you don't define your own type hints in anything you write, you still get the benefits of type checking for free. Um, so another thing that can be done in TypeScript is that if every return point of a function is of a given type, uh, then you get type checking for free on that function. So uh, this thing clearly returns a number even though we say that it doesn't, uh, so type inference can pick that up for us, which is pretty cool. Um, here is a function that can only return a string here, and passing that into something that expects a number will not work. So thanks to type inference, uh, even if you don't care to annotate your own functions, rather just cons uh, consume a type hinted API, you will benefit from testing your own code uh, against constraints that have been provided by third party library developers. Uh, so this is great. You get some sanity checking on your code effectively for free. Um, so this type checking stuff, it's pretty good. Um, but how is it useful if 
not everyone else is out there writing JavaScript code, or is out there writing JavaScript code, uh, rather than writing TypeScript code. Um, fundamental things that you're probably going to use if you write JavaScript code, like uh, you know, jQuery, for example, that's written in raw JavaScript, uh, doesn't use TypeScript, so do you get type checking on that? Uh, well, you get this thing in TypeScript called gradual typing. Now, gradual typing refers to type systems that do not require every function, do not require every variable to participate in the type system. Gradual typing means that only some of the code uh, has to participate in the type system, and that's the stuff that will get type checked. It's completely opt-in. There's two ways to do that. The first is to explicitly declare a type. So I've got a variable here, I say it's a string, therefore it is a string and the type checker knows that it is a string. Uh, alternatively, uh, you can ignore writing your own hints and see if the compiler can go and make a guess itself. So I'm not declaring a type on that variable there. Uh, we've got a function that returns a number, therefore the compiler uh, knows that the variable is a number. Pretty simple. And now JavaScript has type coercion behavior. Uh, as a Python developer, I don't like that, but you know, there's a lot of JavaScript stuff out there that expects type coercion to be a thing you do. For example, like taking text inputs and treating them as numbers, for example. Um, if you want to opt out of the type system, you can. This is invalid TypeScript uh, because I've got a string that looks like the number 42. If this wasn't TypeScript, it would be valid JavaScript. Um, you can declare a type, or sorry, a variable to be of type any. When you declare a thing to be of type any, it means it does not participate in the type system. It could be any type of value. Um, you can use it anywhere. So any is basically the opposite of the object type, if you're familiar with languages with type hierarchies, for example, Python, for example, Java. Uh, if you declare something as object, it means you can only call methods that are defined on the interface for object. So even though we can tell that this variable here is a string, I can't call to uppercase on it. The compiler will reject that because I've said it is an object, um, even though we can see that it is a string. If you declare a thing to be of type any, it means you can call whatever you want on the object and we rely on the standard JavaScript uh, runtime verification behavior to see whether or not we've done the right thing. Um, but this means that the onus is on us as a developer uh, to make sure that what we're doing is correct. So this will pass the TypeScript compiler even though bacon, eggs, and spam is not a thing that's defined on string. It just means it behaves like a plain old JavaScript object, um, so you don't really lose anything. So any is the thing that makes TypeScript's type system actually work well. Everything is assumed to be of type any, that is, there are no type constraints at all until the compiler is absolutely certain that type constraints can apply for you. And this is a big difference between gradual typing and static typing. You don't need to introduce any type constraints until you, the developer, are ready to have your code meet type constraints. They're not compulsory and they don't take effect until the code is ready. So the most important aspect of any, though, is that you can cast from anything to any specific type. So here I have a string. It's known to be a number. Um, so I've put it into a variable called any. I can then say this thing that wasn't any is in fact a number, and then go off and use that like a number. And then the type checker will just check to see whether or not all the uses of that variable is consistent uh, with uses of numbers. So basically, type constraints can be broken if you need them to be broken. And this means that TypeScript can, if you need to, keep the flavor of JavaScript's weak typing, uh, if you need that. And this means that this anything is, is the most powerful and liberating aspect of TypeScript. Let's take a look at why. So say you have some definition of an interface. Um, I'm going to, for no reason at all, call it jQuery. Um, and you know, once you get an object from plain old JavaScript, you can cast it to meet any uh, interface you've defined. So I'm going to take a variable, call it dollars, and say that, it meets this, that this is of type jQuery. And I'm going to take a plain old JavaScript object, which is an any, which means I can pass it into a variable of any interface I say it matches. 
From now on, every call to that dollars variable will be matched against the interface that I've passed into it. jQuery's authors did not need to define the spec. I wrote the spec, but the type system is fully happy with that. That means the onus is on us, the developers, to get the interface declaration right, but if we have got it right, then the type checker in the compiler will make sure that everything matches uh, the interfaces that we provide. And taking advantage of such an interface in your code is easy. Uh, you just need to point out a reference file. Uh, this is very similar to doing an import in Python, very similar to doing an include in C or C++. And there are entire communities out there that are making repositories of TypeScript interfaces for popular JavaScript libraries. Um, the biggest one is called Definitely Typed. It has uh, interfaces for several hundred of the most popular JavaScript libraries, uh, including Node.js, including jQuery. So this means that you can use TypeScript right now for non-trivial code. Because of these interface declarations, any code that anyone has written in vanilla JavaScript can take advantage of TypeScript's type hintings. You just need to have one of these interface declarations. So this means that basically any JavaScript library you care to use will work. So this being a Python conference, we need to talk a bit about Python, otherwise I don't think you'd be getting your money's worth. Um, back to PEP 484. Um, it has been implemented and it is available in the betas of Python 3.5, starting at number one. Uh, all of the type hinting features are implemented within the existing language. The only concrete addition is a file that defines type hinting primitives and a type checker. This implementation is different to TypeScript. Um, TypeScript is a language uh, extension. It needs a preprocessor to go and remove the type hints before you can run it in your browser. So PEP 484 is a relatively non-invasive way of doing this gradual typing thing that TypeScript does uh, in Python. So if you've got Python 3 code, it will still work as Python 3 code. Code which uses type annotations in a different way will still work if you don't throw them at the type checker, and code will benefit from type annotations as type annotations become available for the libraries and modules that you use. If you don't want to pollute the main body of your code uh, with type hints, you don't have to. Um, you can put type hints in a separate .pyi file, um, provided it matches the external structure of the py file that it corresponds to. So if you have a ver uh, function called spam in your Python file, it means you need a matching stub function in the .pyi file called spam. Uh, likewise, if you have classes, you need to have a stub class of the same structure as the actual concrete class in the .py file. Um, this means that your, if your code base is already Python 2 and 3 compatible, um, it won't stop running on Python 2 in order to take advantage of type hinting in Python 3. Um, it also, if you do your unit testing in such a way that your tests are in the same directory as your main code base, um, your test structure is going to be the same as your type hinting uh, structure. Um, basically, the behavior is identical to sort of having C headers, for example, or, um, or in TypeScript, those TypeScript declaration files. So it's no worse than other languages. You can put the type hints in the same file if you want, but you don't have to. Um, once you run your code in Python, the type hints are effectively ignored. Um, so from the point of view of running code, it's like type erasure. It doesn't affect the runtime. Um, this is because doing type checking at runtime in Python is, would be terribly slow. Um, but if you wanted to instrument your code such that you were verifying that everything that goes into every function, everything that comes out is correct, um, that might be a thing that you could do in the future once you have comprehensively type hinted code. And I expect that this thing will happen in a few years. So why should you care about type hinting in Python? This is not a thing that you've done for the last however long you have been developing Python. Um, why should you care about it now? Okay, uh, fun audience participation time. Who here writes unit tests? Okay, the rest of you don't put your hands up. You can put your hands up because it's embarrassing if you don't unit test. Um, who here who actually does unit test uh, verifies that, the, that their code behaves absolutely correctly with every single wrong type of variable that goes into it? 
you're lying. Um, no, I just use Haskell. Have, don't heckle during talks, please. Especially not to say you use Haskell. That's even more embarrassing than not unit testing. Um, so type hinting is an easy way to get comprehensive tests that make sure that everything that goes into your code and comes out of your code is behaving correctly. You'll get more comprehensive test coverage for type matching from just writing a few type annotations than you will ever write uh, unit tests for. If you use PyLint, this is just another linting phase before you do your commits. Um, it's just another sanity check, just like making sure your code is formatting compliant, um, has correct spelling and, and alphabetization and stuff like that. Um, you no longer need to write separate documentation about what your parameters, um, what your params, your function takes, what they return. Uh, you can automatically generate uh, type verification documentation and you can test that that documentation is up to date. If your documentation is wrong, your tests will be failing at the same time. Perhaps most importantly, if you are a person who uses an IDE, um, and Guido said this in his keynote, um, if you are expecting to get auto, yeah, autocomplete behavior uh, out of your IDE, you probably will not get it in Python. Um, they reckon that only about 50 to 60% of Python statements can accurately have their type return types and parameter types inferred. That means that if you're starting out with Python, 40 to 50% of the stuff that you write will not have accurate autocomplete in your IDE. And if you're an IDE user coming from Java or coming from .NET, that is super important. And you can't do that without in Python at the moment. Type hinting is going to get that up above 80% of, of return statements. So we're going to complete this talk with a discussion of duck typing. Python is very famous for it. Um, writing in a duck type language means you can write code that feels completely natural, but is very difficult to express uh, formally using a type system. Um, a good example of this in practice is the requests project. And the developers of requests are on the record as saying that the stuff that is available in Python 3.5's type hinting will never be sufficient for requests. Um, requests relies really heavily on, on duck typing, on sort of natural type checking, so you know, humans making sense of things rather than um, automated type checking to verify that things are correct. Um, in requests, there's a parameter called files, which lets you specify file names or content blobs or actual file-like handles for things, uh, as well as HTTP headers. It may let you provide a single item. It may let you provide a sequence of items. It may let you take a dictionary mapping of items. It gives you all of these options so that you don't have to do pre-processing on your data before you pass it into requests. This type hint here is the shortest way of describing um, that parameter in Python uh, in the Python type hinting um, format. Uh, Corey Benfield, who's in the audience, wrote this. Um, this is disgusting. <laughs> like, there's there's no if if you read that, you would not learn anything. You could read the documentation and you would understand more than that would describe to you. So they'll just use any and say, go look at the documentation to get the right behavior, and that is a completely valid thing to do. Projects like requests will be full of type hints like this one, so you should not bother doing type assertions for those. There's excellent documentation in requests. The behavior of requests is opaque enough uh, that those type hints would never be particularly useful to you. So any is actually a really good type assertion because it says to the developer, go lo look at the documentation. Now, request itself makes no guarantees about what comes out of it. Uh, but we as developers know the behavior of the APIs we're consuming, for example. So we can make assertions ourselves about these libraries with weaker type constraints. So here we have a, uh, an API. We're going to hit an API that we know returns some sort of JSON thing. Uh, so we're going to say response.json out of the requests uh, API. And we happen to know that this looks like a dictionary. So we're going to assert ourselves that this is going to come out as a dictionary. Then everything that uses our wrapper function 
will get type hints, uh, will get type checking. So we're providing an extra assertion of the return type that's coming out of requests there. Um, we, we know that we can make this assertion, therefore we make it and the rest of our code base gets that assertion. So type hints aren't about making everything super specific and verifiable like Java. That's never going to fly in Python because there's so much Python code out there that just is not going to ever be type hinted that well. But you can use type hints where they will help your code be more verifiable and I reckon you'll enjoy using them. I've enjoyed using them with TypeScript. So it's not the end of the world. Stop being alarmist about it. Um, you don't have to use it if you don't want to. It is not Python 4 embedded in a single pep. That's ridiculous. And there are benefits to using it. So if you want to get a feel for that in some code that you might already be writing, uh, TypeScript is available. It's open source at typescriptlang.org. It's also available via NPM. And that is the end of this talk. I think we have some time for questions. One or two, if anyone wants to not heckle. Is there any way to do this in Python Sorry. 2? Is there a way to do this in Python 2? Um, I understand that there is, but it is not built into the language. Um, the project that this is based on is called MyPy, and I have a sneaking suspicion that they are doing Python 2 stuff with this, but I am not entirely certain about that. OK, uh, we have a response in the audience that says, yes, it works pretty easily with Python 2. I think it's just done not using Python features. Uh, we have one over here. Can you provide those type interface uh, definitions for third-party code? Does it have to be in the same directory? or? Uh, no, it does not. You can provide your own, um, your own declarations. I, I imagine it's pretty much the same as how it behaves as, as in TypeScript. Uh, are there any other questions? Well, in that case, I hope you are far less uh, confused about um, type hints than you were when we started. Um, and thank you all for coming along.